And in these ecosystems, as I said, mosses are really dominant. They're really common and they're very diverse in the north. And these are just some photos of some of the moss species that are found here. And um, more importantly, and that's what we're all interested in, they're actually colonized by bacteria, cyanobacteria that fix atmospheric nitrogen. And um, so these bacteria, they sit on top of the moss leaves and the moss leaf here is in the background and the red stuff on top, that's of course all cyanobacteria. And um, it's mostly nostoc we find on the mosses and, um, but also some other species, but they're not so common and abundant actually. Okay. So to give you an idea of some of the numbers here we're talking about when we look at one common moss in the Arctic, Tomentupnum nitens, um, this moss with its associates fixes up to three kilogram of nitrogen per hectare in the snow free period, that is from May to October. Um, and to put that into context, um, when we look at the yeah, ecosystem nitrogen cycle, as I told you, we have this um, deposition from the atmosphere of around two kilogram. Now we add the nitrogen fixation that's happening on the mosses by the cyanobacteria, which is more than three kilogram of nitrogen per hectare per year. So that means that more than half of total ecosystem nitrogen input in these northern pristine ecosystems comes potentially from the moss carpet. And that's pretty cool, I think, and um, shows how important they actually are. And um, in my lab, so we're very much interested in yeah, how this process, nitrogen fixation, is affected by different factors. So we look at pollution, climate change factors, limiting nutrients, and so on. And I will talk about some of the things we're working on now uh, today, and I don't have time, of course, to talk about everything. But, um, well, first of all, what does it matter to the ecosystem that um, there are mosses sitting there colonized by cyanobacteria that fix atmospheric nitrogen? Is this important for the ecosystem? Does this nitrogen that is fixed actually, is this actually available to the rest of the ecosystem for other plants in the same system? So to test that, we went to the far north, Greenland, Sackenberg, where we had these, um, we collected small ecosystem components, different plants and also of course mosses. And we incubated those with 15 N labeled dinitrogen. And then we tracked this label into different ecosystem components to see if this fixed nitrogen that went through the cyanobacteria um, is taken up by other plants, for example. Well, and that's what we found here. We have three days after we added this 15N label, here's 15N enrichment. And in green, we have the nitrogen fixers. So that's mosses and also organic crust. So free living cyanobacteria, lichens and mosses. And these were enriched with 15N and they should be because they took it up. But quite surprising to us was that other plants in the same system like grasses and shrubs they were similarly enriched with 15N. So that actually means that, well, this fixed nitrogen by the cyanobacteria entered the soil nitrogen pool and was taken up by other plants in the system. So to answer this question here, if nitrogen fixation in the high Arctic is a source of new nitrogen, the short answer is yes, it is. It's quite important. Okay, so now we know it's important and now we can look at what affects this process. And um, one very important topic at the moment is of course climate change. And you have seen figures like that that show that we have changed the temperature across the globe and also the precipitation pattern has changed quite a lot due to our doing. So temperature and moisture are really strong yeah, drivers of climate change and we are also interested in how this affects nitrogen fixation in mosses. And um, this is a study led by um, PhD candidate Aya, where she looked at temperature effects on nitrogen fixation. And this was a study she conducted in um, Abisko in northern Sweden, subarctic tundra, quite far north here. 
And here we have these um, open top chambers installed in the field that increase the temperature. So they simulate climate warming. And here I am measured nitrification in two really common moss species in these ecosystems, Carosium and Hylocomium. Um, don't worry about the names. And um, so what she found was this. If anything, warming actually decreased nitrogen fixation in mosses. And that was a bit surprising to us because normally when you increase temperature, you increase biological activity. But we also have to keep the organisms in mind that are involved here. And mosses, they're really special plants. They are non-vascular and they um, easily lose water when temperatures increase and they cannot control water loss from the surface. So they really easily dry out. And when the moss is dry, basically nothing happens. No activity is happening, including nitrogen fixation. So maybe this negative effect was a drying out effect. So temperature and moisture probably interact to influence any activity within the moss carpet. And to get at this yeah, interactive effect of temperature and moisture, we did another study, which was led by then bachelor student Pia, who got mosses from Arctic tundra, where we have a mean annual temperature of minus three, then from the subarctic tundra, a bit warmer, 0.2 degrees mean annual temperature. And then we had the warmest site in this experiment, the temperate heats here from Denmark, around eight degrees mean annual temperature. And then Pia incubated the mosses at different temperatures and different moss moisture levels to look at these interactive effects of temperature and moisture on nitrogen fixation. Okay, that's what we expected. So we thought the more moist the moss is, the higher the activity, and this should be true for all mosses independent of where they were collected from. In um, response to the temperature, we thought the strongest response we would find in the moss from the warmest side, least steep slope from the colder side, and um, even less steep slope from the coldest side here on the Arctic. So that's what we expected. And um, the reality looked quite different as it is so often. Um, so we didn't find a consistent shift in the temperature sensitivity across the ecosystems. But what we found was that um, temperature becomes more important in the colder ecosystems. And um, so we are still working on these types of experiments because it seems a bit more complicated than we thought in the beginning. And um, yeah, we're still thinking about this, what it actually means. But temperature and moisture are both important drivers of nitrogen fixation in mosses, and um, they also interact strongly to influence the activity. Okay, I would like to talk a bit about pollution effects, and I will start with nitrogen. And for this, I take you now to a boreal forest site in Aritzia in northern Sweden. And here we went to um, busy roads in the forest. So this is 800 cars per day. This is busy for northern Sweden. Then remote roads, less than five cars per day. And then, we, when, and then we collected mosses at different distances away from this road, from these roads and measured nitrogen fixation. And we expected some effect of these busy highways. So probably an inhibition of activity. And um, that's what we found a quite nice and clear pattern. So quite high activity all along these very remote roads and low activity close to the busy roads but increasing activity with distance away from the roads. So that indicates some yeah, inhibition of the road-derived um, nitrogen on nitrogen fixation in mosses. And then we were interested in if this, um, yeah, this inhibition of the process can be reversed, um, if this process can recover, in this case, from nitrogen stress. And so we collected mosses and added a lot of nitrogen in the lab. And um, what we then did was simply rinse the mosses with water 
to get rid of the nitrogen um, of the MOS system. And then activity actually increased upon removal of the stressor. So recovery is possible, it's quite fast, and it's a very dynamic system. You add nitrogen, activity is inhibited, you remove it, activity increases. And this also nicely shows that the effects of nitrogen are really direct and causal. It's not some sort of confounding effect here from these roads, but it's a nice direct effect. Okay, so nitrogen, not so good for nitrogen fixation mosses. And um, I would like now to talk a bit about heavy metal pollution. And I picked this study because it's quite um, a fun, yeah, fun experiment here because there's this um, yeah, pristine ecosystem in the north around Abisko where we have the subarctic tundra ecosystem type. It should be unpolluted and pristine, yet we have this railroad crossing right through the nice pristine ecosystem. And this railroad carries iron ore. And the thing is that close to Abisko in Kiruna, that's 90 kilometers south of Abisko, we have the largest underground iron ore mine in the whole world. And from this mine, we have this train crossing via Abisko to Norway for the iron ore to be shipped away. So we have this train once an hour going right through the pristine ecosystem. And this is a photo taken close to the railroad and these dark little balls are not berries, they're actually um, iron pellets. So that's how it looks. And um, so we thought we should test how nitrogen fixation in mosses is affected by this iron input. And for this, um, Astrid, the master student then collected the usual suspect mosses. We work a lot with hylochromium and fluorosium, but also a lichen that is colonized by moss stock. Um, so Astrid collected them at different distances away from the roads and we looked at the metal content in them, but also at nitrogen fixation in those organisms. And here you see the metal content in uh, moss, lichen and soil for some of the metals we looked at. So, and here we have the distance gradient where we collected the samples from. And um, for iron and copper, we find a nice distance gradient. So the closer to the railroad, the higher the metal content. Um, not so much for zinc and lead, but we definitely found a nice iron gradient. Okay, what about nitrogen fixation then? Well, almost nothing. There wasn't a clear pattern in nitrogen fixation at all along the gradient um, in the mosses here in green and in brown the lichen here. So there was, it was basically stable along the gradient. And that was a bit um, yeah, surprising to us because the iron input was really, really high. And then we thought, okay, maybe it has something to do with the nitrogen input along this gradient um, because we didn't expect a strong nitrogen pollution from the railroad, um, but we measured nitrogen input anyway along the gradient. And that's what we find. Um, so nitrogen deposition here along the distance gradient. And there also wasn't a clear pattern. It was more or less stable along the gradient. So this could explain the lack of an effect of the gradient on nitrogen fixation. It seems like heavy metals are maybe not so important or inhibiting for this process, but nitrogen is. And another thing I would like to mention here you see the large variation in some of the samples. And um, well, when you do field work, you have to be prepared for many different things. And one of the things are lemmings. And um, in 2015, when we did the study, we had a lemming year in Abisko. And just to explain to you how we measure nitrogen deposition, we have these iron resin capsules installed in the field embedded in glass wool to keep them stable and moist and so on. And these resin capsules are left in the field for several months to collect all the ions that we then extract later in the lab. So when we wanted to collect these resin capsules, 
all the glass wool was all over the field sites and all puffed up and the rest and some of the resins were missing. So I think the lemmings took them for some reason and we lost some replicates that could explain these large variations. Um, yeah, so that's how it is when you work in the field. Uh, you have to yeah, be prepared to encounter lemmings, um, but they're very cute, so you can't be angry with them. Okay, so nitrogen inhibits nitrogen fixation. Heavy metal pollution is maybe not such a big thing for nitrogen fixation. Another thing we are very much interested in is um, limiting nutrients for the process of nitrogen fixation. And when you work with nitrogen fixation, two nutrients really pop into your mind, that's molybdenum and phosphorus. And as you know, molybdenum is part of the nitrogenase enzyme complex. So the idea is if you have more molybdenum, you could produce more enzyme, fix more nitrogen. And with phosphorus, um, phosphorus is good for many different things, but since nitrogen fixation is a really energy costly process, you need a lot of ATP to do it so phosphorus could sustain the process. So we did some studies on this and I don't have time to talk about it in detail, but what I can say is that, well, it depends what happens when you add the nutrients. Um, because, we, for example, we found that molybdenum um, can promote nitrogen fixation in the short term, one day after the additions, um, but phosphorus can promote it in the medium term, several weeks after the additions, um, but there were no long-term effects of these additions at several years um, on nitrogen fixation in mosses. But um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about this in more detail if you're interested. Okay, so now I would like to talk a bit about the future, what we are planning to do. And um, so for Arctic tundra and boreal forest systems, we know that these small cyanobacteria associations are really important. They contribute with more than half to total ecosystem nitrogen input. And we also know more or less which factors are important in driving this process. And what we want to do next is to go to another ecosystem type, to tropical cloud forests, because here there are also many mosses, which is great. Um, but well, to the best of my knowledge, hardly anyone has looked at if these mosses in these cloud forests are colonized by cyanobacteria. And if so, who is there? How much do they fix? Are they important for the ecosystem? So that's something we want to look at in the future and also have a look at how climate change will impact this process because we know these forests will become much more dry in the future climate and it probably is bad for nitrogen fixation. Another thing we're very much interested in is the relationship between moss and the colonizing cyanobacteria. Do the bacteria just sit on the moss leaves and use them as a parking spot or is there more to them? Do they interact by, for example, exchanging nutrients with each other? So the bacteria could transfer nitrogen to the moss and in return receive some sort of carbon source. We have no idea. Okay. And sometimes it's not so easy to tell when the future actually starts. So in our case, some things have started already. Um, and so we got mosses from tropical cloud forest in Peru. And this is led again by Aya together with um, Anders Primi from our institute. So we got mosses um, from the forest side in Peru and luckily they were all colonized by cyanobacteria, more or less. And then Aya exposed them to different moisture and temperature levels to see how a potential shift in climate would affect um, nitrogen fixation. And um, this is some of the results. So here we have the temperature, 10 and 20 degrees incubation, the different blue um, symbols indicate different moisture levels. And we have here two different moss species. And this is nitrogen fixation over several weeks. And you can see that Temperature doesn't seem to make a big difference for these mosses actually, but moisture seems to be quite important. So we have more than doubling of the rates when we double the moss moisture content. 
And there are some differences between the moss species in terms of activity, but there are probably also some differences in the community composition that colonize these mosses. And um, this is very much work in progress and Aya is working on it to look at the community composition on these mosses. Okay. Um, I have alluded to that a bit that um, actually different moss species are really differently colonized by cyanobacteria. Even though, for example, these four moss species, they grow in the same habitat, they grow together, intermingled, most of them, yet they have very different rates of cyanobacterial colonization. And we, we didn't really know why that is. And um, Shin, the postdoc in my lab who visited for a year, took this task on to look for the moss factor. So what, what is it about the different moss species that could harbor more or less cyanobacteria? And um, so here we have these four different moss species, um, colonization of the leaves versus activity nitrogen fixation. And you see that the moss species differ a bit in colonization rates. So why is that? Well, we looked at the moss morphology because we thought, well, for example, the larger the leaf, the more cyanobacteria could sit on the leaves, colonize it. So that's what we tested here. We have the counts of cyanobacteria and this is really counted individual cells. So it was a lot of work for Shin to do. And um, here we have different uh, moss morphology traits. So we have, for example, the width of the leaf at the base and the leaf area. And basically what you see here, the bigger the leaf, the fewer cyanobacteria sit on them which was a bit counterintuitive, but on the other hand, we knew that well, activity is really um, dependent on the moisture level of the moss. So maybe there's something with the with water traits of the moss that are related to morphology in turn. So Shin looked also at, um, for example, the hydration rate of different moss species. So how long it takes for dry moss to hydrate and also to to dry out basically. And here we have the colonization and here the activity. And you see that, well, this hydration rate seems to be quite important. So the faster the moss can soak up the water, the more bacteria are there and the more active they are. So the colonization and activity are related to the water traits of the different moss species, um, which is also in turn actually, of course, related to the morphology of the moss. The bigger the leaves, the, yeah, maybe the longer it takes to, to absorb water and so on. So, but this is also very much work in progress. And yeah, we are just working on this right now. And then to the relationship between mosses and cyanobacteria, if there's any, and um, this is work led by postdoc Danilo who is um, at the moment really busy in trying to get the moss and bacteria growing independent of each other. And um, it's a really long process, but I think Danilo is really doing great and making a lot of progress here. Um, but it's not so easy actually to get the moss really axenic and to get the sand bacteria grown without the moss. Well, this is the first step, but we are very close, I think, to, to managing it. And once we have that separated them, I think then we can do many, many um, fun experiments once we have achieved that. Okay, and before I, I finish up, I would like to um, yeah, advertise a bit. Um, I'm looking for a PhD candidate starting next spring. Deadline is end of January. And yeah, feel free to contact me if you're interested or if you know someone who's interested and uh, we are looking forward to a new team member. Okay, and with that, I thank for your attention. I thank my funding, um, yeah, and I'm happy to take questions. Yeah.